going to press the record button. Fantastic. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome from Dundee again. It's great to see so many people here uh, live for the, uh, the our latest uh, lecture. So today we're going to have the internal moot problem. We're going to look at legal issues. We're really getting to the more exciting part of, of the training. And uh, I know that some of the, the, the school workshops have begun and they've been going really, really well. So we're going to have an action packed uh, session this afternoon. Let me pass back to you, Libby, and uh, you can deal with any housekeeping issues. Thanks, Professor Peter. So I won't uh, I won't be long because I know that we've got a lot to get through today. Um, but be before I hand over to our, our student tutors today, just a quick reminder for those of you who have whose schools have which the schools that have not yet sent us all of their availability. Um, workshops will run until the end of next week. Um, they are optional, but we would really encourage you to sign up for these these sessions. They're small group. They're really discursive. It's a chance for you to ask lots of questions and really understand how to get into the internals moot problem. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Ria, I think, is starting us today. So, hello, everyone. Um, Kelsey's just shared our screen there for our PowerPoint for today, which is focusing on the moot problem for the internal competition. And we're going to be discussing in more depth the legal issues in the moot problem and going over both sides of the argument. So the learning aims for today will be to understand the basics of contract law, and we're going to go over that and how it feeds into the mooting problem and speak a little bit about how a contract is formed, and then to discuss the application of the postal rule, what the postal rule is, how it applies in the problem, and then talk about damages and the potential ramifications of that. So we're just going to start going over the facts of the case in the first instance. So I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to have a look at the mooting problem yet, but I'm just gonna do a brief summary of the facts here. So the problem is about Cara who owns a cafe in Dundee and she recently contacted Verified Coffee Limited, which is owned by Vanessa, who is a coffee bean supplier. And she sent a letter to Vanessa on the 12th of March staying, stating that she'll purchase coffee beans on the first of every month from April for £30. And Vanessa responded by email on the 14th of March 2022, stating um, that that wouldn't be acceptable. She rejected the offer and would accept £40 for the coffee beans um, delivered on the same date. And Cara accepted this offer the day after by posting a letter. And on that same day, Vanessa emailed Cara to withdraw her offer. On the 1st of April, when the coffee beans from Verified Coffee Limited didn't show up, Cara then raised an action against Vanessa for a breach of contract. And the judge at first instance held that the contract was not enforceable against Vanessa as Vanessa had successfully withdrawn her offer and was not liable to pay any damages to Cara and Cara now appeals to the Court of Appeal for the mooting problem. So the two grounds of appeal in this case is that the judge at first instance should have applied the postal rule, which would have found that the contract was enforceable as Cara's acceptance of the offer was sent before the offer was revoked. So we're going to be breaking down that first ground of appeal over the next couple of slides, just speaking a little bit more in depth about the postal rule. Um, and then the second ground of appeal is that Verified Coffee Limited was in breach of contract by failing to deliver the coffee beans and that they should be liable to pay damages. So if you are the respondents in this moot rather than the appellants, you would be submitting grounds of response. So the grounds of response aren't stated at the bottom of the problem, like the grounds of appeal, and you can choose to phrase those grounds of response, grounds of response however you choose, but they should oppose the arguments of the appellant kind of almost directly. So if these are some potential grounds of response that you could use here. So like the ground of appeal said that the postal rule should be applied, your ground of response should say that the judge at first instance was correct not to apply the postal rule. You're wanting to uphold the decision made at first instance. And then um, an example of the second ground for breach of contract 
would be in the alternative, even if there was an enforceable contract, Verified Coffee Limited is not liable to pay damages for the advertising costs or any damage to the reputation of Cara's Coffee. So just a quick note about the start of that sentence there. In the alternative is a argument that you'd put forward if the judge doesn't accept the first argument that you're attempting to make. So if the judge isn't satisfied about your postal rule ground, they'll then consider the ground that you're making regarding breach of contract. Right, so now I will kind of start with the basics of contract law. So what is a contract? In simple terms, it is an agreement between two or more parties and it creates legally enforceable obligations. Now, um, there are several things you need in a contract, but just for this problem and competition, you need to only be concerned with an offer and whether the offer has been accepted. So um, the intention is presumed, as mentioned in the slide, because in the case of you know ordinary business commercial transactions, we can always presume that parties have an intention to create legally binding obligations. Now, what is acceptance? So the general rule is that your acceptance of an offer must be communicated. That is the general rule. Now, the exception to this rule is the postal rule, which kind of states that acceptance is um, binding as soon as you post the letter. We'll go into that in the next slide. And briefly, what is revocation, which is mentioned in the moot problem and the grounds of appeal. So um, you can revoke an offer. And what that means is that you kind of take back the offer. And when you revoke um, the offer, it must be communicated to the person that you have offered this item. So for example, um, Kelsey and I, I offer Kelsey 10 pounds for my water bottle. Um, and then I say, oh, wait, I kind of like this water bottle. I'm not going to offer it to you anymore. So I've got to communicate it to Kelsey before she accepts um, my offer for the water bottle. So I hope that's clear. Now we'll move on to the postal rule. So as I mentioned, the general rule is that you must communicate your acceptance of an offer to the person, but the postal rule is an exception. So the postal rule states that an acceptance is created at the time that you post your acceptance letter instead of the date that the person receives the letter. So I'll use another person. So I'll use Ria's name in this case. So let's say um, Ria writes or tells me she's selling her phone and I write her a letter. Um, let's say she sells, she offers it to me on Monday, like in the case. So she offers it to me on Monday um, and I write a letter to her the next day on Tuesday and I say, oh, lovely, I'll get your phone. I'll buy it off of you for 200 pounds, let's say. And then on Wednesday, Ria still hasn't received my letter. On Wednesday, Ria writes to me and says, Hannah, never mind, I want to keep my phone. And then suddenly on Friday, I receive her letter and I go, oh gosh, but I already accepted it. So based on the postal rule, the minute on Tuesday when I sent Ria that acceptance letter of getting her phone, buying it off of her, a contract was already made. Therefore, um, Ria's revocation, the letter that she sent to me, does not apply. Um, it's ineffective because a contract has been created between me and Ria. So that is how the post postal rule works. So essentially, in simple terms, actual communication is not necessary. It is only um, as soon as the acceptance has been posted, not when it has been received by the offerer, by the person who has offered the item to you. Now, there are two exceptions to the postal rule. So firstly, I think some of you raised amazing questions about the significance and how complex the postal rule is. So one of the exceptions of the postal rule is when it would manifest inconvenience and absurdity. So um, the case that I referenced here is in your judgment pack, so do have a look at it. But essentially what this case stated was that um, the postal rule does not apply when a method of communication has been agreed so for example, um, I sell to one of you my phone. 
And I state to you specifically that I need to receive the acceptance by next Wednesday. Therefore, by stating that, the acceptance, so your acceptance letter to me must be received. It doesn't matter when you posted it, I must have received that acceptance letter um, because I already stated very clearly the method of which I want the offer to be communicated to me. So in this case of um, Hallwell Securities and Hughes, um, an option was granted to person P and it said that the notice must be in writing to person D within six months. Now, one week before the deadline, um, you know, an, an acceptance letter containing the notice was posted to person P, was posted by person P, but person D never received it. Now, the postal rule would state that this should apply because person P had already um, you know, posted the acceptance letter. But in this case, which is the exception to the post of rule, the Court of Appeal held that because the offer explicitly stated that it required notice, so person D must have received it and been notified, the post of rule could not be applied. Now we'll move on to the second exception, which is the revocation of offers. And this case as well is in your judgment pack. So do have a look um, to kind of understand the facts. But briefly, what this case stated was that posted acceptance will be binding. So um, if I send a letter of acceptance to an offer to you, it is binding as long as I had not received any information about um, the offer being revoked. So an example that I've written down and included in this slide is, let's say, um, Gosh, let's use another person, Rihanna, for this case. Now, um, Rihanna receives an offer from me. So on Monday, Rihanna likes my offer. And on Monday, she writes me a letter to accept my offer. And on Wednesday, I send her a letter of revocation. I say, oh, gosh, Ria, I take it back. I'm so sorry. But then on Thursday, I receive um, Ria, uh, sorry, I receive Rihanna's acceptance letter. So the question is, is this binding or not? Now, as you can see the answer, it is binding. Why? Why is it binding? It is because Rhea man Rihanna managed to post her acceptance before I sent my letter of revocation. So in a sense, I need to communicate to her before she manages to post her acceptance of the offer. Okay. I hope that is clear. Do ask any questions if you want me to go over anything. So now we'll move on to kind of should the postal rules still apply? And um, as I mentioned, someone brought it up. It does cause a lot of complexities. And I mean, how many people write letters these days to um, for commercial transactions? Now, basically the purpose behind the postal rules, some of the cases are super old. They're dating back to the 1800s. So it makes sense why the postal rule worked back then but the purpose is to provide certainty that you are able to create a binding contract and you are not affected by the delays of you know, postal service or other parties. So kind of to level the playing grounds that might be affected you know, due to um, factors that should not um, be, factors that would unfairly um, prejudice you in a commercial transaction. So since the introduction of the postal rule, since then, now we obviously communicate our acceptance but via email um, and other instantaneous forms of communication. Now, in the case of Entores Limited and Miles Far East Corporation, the court held that acceptance only takes place when the offer receives the acceptance in the case of instantaneous forms of communication. So meaning if I emailed Kelsey about an offer, she emailed me the acceptance, the acceptance would only take place the minute I um, get her email because the presumption of instantaneous forms of communication is that you receive um, messages efficiently and almost immediately. And I've got many questions. There are a number of questions coming in. Do you want me to moderate them a little bit for you, Hannah? That's lovely, please do. Fantastic. So so we'll go with the questions in the Q&A first. Um, we have a question saying, in the revocation of offer section, why would the offer be binding 
Could you do a short, slow ex explanation, please? Thank you. Okay, um, I will slow down and I will kind of go over it. So essentially, um, let's see, essentially for the revocation of offers, the timeline is the minute I post an acceptance, it is already binding. It is a contract that has been made. So that's the timing. But let's say if I was told by, so let's create another situation, me and Kelsey again. Um, so let's say I sell my um, bag to Kelsey and Kelsey, I sell my bag to Kelsey today. And let's say tomorrow I quickly tell Kelsey, Kelsey, I'm sorry, I would like to revoke the offer. And suddenly Kelsey cheekily kind of sends me an acceptance letter and says, well, postal rules should apply you know um so hannah i want your bag and i say well no i already revoked the offer i communicated this to you so that is when that's how kind of the exception works in the example that was given it's very different because the person only communicated the revocation after i had posted after person a posted their acceptance letter yeah what you've got to remember is that the postal rule only applies to acceptances, to letters of acceptance. It does not apply to letters of revocations, revocations. So a letter of revocation would only take effect once it was actually received by the other person, if that makes sense. So it wouldn't be until maybe two days later. Um, so in that two day time, the other person is free to accept and it would be binding. And we can understand it's a bit complicated, but kind of going back to the moot problem where the revocation isn't so much of an issue. Well, actually it is. <laughs> Let's go back to the facts um, because we really want to make sure you understand in the context of this current problem. So on the 15th of March, um, Vanessa posted a letter saying, I accept. Vanessa, sorry. Cara posted a letter saying, I accept. Vanessa emailed revoking her offer. Now, from, although it doesn't say explicitly, the letter was sent before the email was sent. Um, so even if that letter had got lost in the post, it doesn't matter because, or she didn't receive it until eight days later. It doesn't matter because it was it took effect and it made a binding contract as soon as she put it in the mail. Whereas, say the email, um, if it had kind of went into someone's junk or something like that, then it it wouldn't have actually mattered because... Karen needed to actually read it before she sent an acceptance for the postal rule to apply. Hopefully that makes more sense. I don't know. So lots of questions coming in. So oh, no. Um, no, no, it's fine. I think we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little bit longer on questions, but then we'll move on because I suspect that some of the answers will happen as, as we go. Um, so another question saying, wouldn't the contract in this situation be valid seeing as the acceptance letter was posted before Vanessa sent her email? So I guess that's already been answered with, with the answer but that you gave. That's the appellant's argument. We're wondering right. if the first, basically the role of the respondents is to raise the argument about manifest inconvenience and absurdity. So it's whether we can apply that. We understand that the second exception probably doesn't apply in this case. So you are correct. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the postal rule applies or that it should apply. <laughs> and, then, and, and that's the whole point of the, the, the problem, I guess, isn't it? So we, there's only so much that we can say. Yeah. Um, so uh, another question saying uh, about the, the um, whether an email could be put in the same category as a telex in that sense. Is it an instantaneous form of communication? Are you going to touch on that in, in a little while or? No. So I, when I made this MIT problem, I don't believe there's any case law in the UK about whether or not emails are applied to do with the postal rule, but it doesn't really matter because the letter was definitely sent first. Um, so while it's a questionable area, you don't need to worry about that for this okay. problem. And um, we have one, one uh, um, attendee who's put their hand up, but they've also put the question in the, in the Q and A. So I'll read it out. The, uh, the quote from the postal rule in in court states that it must have been within the contemplation that according to ordinary uses of mankind, the post might be used as a means of communicating the acceptance of an offer. Don't emails count as an ordinary use of mankind today? 
<laughs> you're being grilled today <laughs> guys these it's all about interpretation isn't Absolutely. it and how the judge is going to say it so that's the question is yeah but really the argument that you want to say is whether the letter is an ordinary use of mankind because that was the mode of acceptance so if you're saying it is then the postal rule applies if you're saying it's not then you can't apply the postal rule because that was that was not an ordinary use of mankind. Why would you communicate that way? It's like if I was to send, right, we'll go back to Hannah's weird examples. If I was to send a carrier pigeon, that would make no sense. And it's probably going to be slower than if I sent her a text. And um, so in that sense, that's kind of where that rule comes in. But again, you have to remember these cases are from the 1800s. And, um, you know, what I mean, they didn't expect more instantaneous modes of communication to come into effect. And that's what we're saying in this instance. But you have to remember that, and we kind of spoke about this in the workshops, Cara did send a letter first. Vanessa could have had the option to say, I only want an acceptance through email. I only want it through, you know, telephone, but she didn't. So here we are debating the whole point, but really good questions, guys. Um, and clearly you're thinking about the types of arguments you've got to come up with. And I think we'll move on because I think the we've kind of answered these kind of questions so we'll move on <laughs> if, I, if i could just jump in for a second what, what we're also really looking to see is how well you use the cases that we have provided uh in in the judgments pack and indeed if you've also gone to look at the uh, the full text of the judgments as well to get some additional quotes so it's it's that way in which you use the material that you've got that that that's super important and and moots are always designed to be <clears throat> hopefully fairly well balanced uh, and uh, yeah provided you've got good good arguments that that you you're not just inventing but you're relating to what judges have said in the cases we've distributed we'll look upon that favorably Okay, Hannah, are you done with this? I'm just going to add one more thing. Um, I was not expecting a quote from a judge to be mentioned today, but wow, am I excited for the moots. So I think a lot of your questions, they it's hard for us to properly answer because you don't want to give it away, but those are exactly the kind of things that you'd want to include in your submissions, and I can't wait to see how you um, progress to develop it. And now I will pass it on to Kelsey to kind of talk about damages. Yeah, I'm just quickly unmuting myself. Uh, we do have another question. I can't. I don't know if we answered this one about would the postal rule still apply if the letter had been sent, but the withdrawal of the offer was sent through faster communication like email, and the person taking the offer agrees with the with the withdrawal. Um, yeah, that's kind of obviously what the moot problem is about in terms of it was the withdrawal was sent through email. Um, we from the moot problem, we can't be sure, and you can't really guess whether she actually received that um, and whether there was any more forms of communication between them but I, what you can take from the fact is Vanessa clearly assumed that there was no agreement and Cara assumed that there was um, but really the question for the judge is not what were the minds of the parties after that happened but when was an enforceable contract actually made and um, so hopefully that clears that up please don't invent facts about what they were talking about afterwards try to stick as closely to the facts as possible okay so we're moving on from postal rules uh, to kind of a second complicated issue which is to do with damages now um damages if you've not heard of it before is a legal term which essentially means monetary compensation and um, now it can be for financial loss for damage to reputation could be for damage to personal injury things like that um, but in this instance, what we're thinking is um, it's a monetary award aimed at putting the party in the position he would have been in if the other party had performed according to the contract. So there's kind of and the judge can look at this two ways. And we say there are kind of aims. They can either put them in the position that they would have been in had the contract been performed. So based on what they expected. So in this instance, Cara would be saying, well, I would have made this amount of profit uh, based on the coffee beans. So that's the money I want. The second one is put the innocent party in a position that they would have been in had they not relied on the contract in the first place. And this is different because we're not looking at profits. We're looking at what money has she spent um, in order to kind of try and get the contract 
well, how, what money has she spent because of the contract? So in this instance, it was the advertising costs and potentially she'd already paid for the coffee beans. So she would be entitled to that money back because we're trying to put her in the position she was in before there was a contract. So those are two different kind of things. Um, and it's up to you which ones you argue to the judge. But we've got to remember, um, and I think we're going to talk about this, kind of how we view damages. Um, and that can be a bit different. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading the questions in the Q&A. Could you please return to the previous slide where I asked whether the postal rule should apply? Um, you want to note down the case. So it is in the judgment pack. Uh, it's Howell Securities. So... Um, if that's okay, we'll just move on because we've got a lot to get uh, a lot to get through today. And does the potential coffee sales for the day count? Um, yeah, it could do. We've obviously not given you exact figures, so you won't be arguing exact figures, but you could just say um, we're claiming damages based off profits that she would have made had she been able to sell the coffee beans. Okay, so... The whole thing to do with damages is remoteness. And this essentially means like, was it so closely connected with the actual breach of contract in order to be recoverable? Um, so they must prove that the loss was not too remote and that it was kind of expected, uh, an expected loss. For example, in order to claim back the money that she spent on the coffee beans, but they hadn't arrived, that's obviously remote because... Obviously, she was going to pay for the coffee beans. Um, but I think an example I used in the workshops was if she'd never kind of used extravagant advertising costs before, but decided for this instance to hire a big billboard outside Dundee University and paid £5,000 for it, would that have been within the contemplation of the parties? Would that have been remote enough for her to actually get damages back? So the basic rule is found in Hadley um, and Baxendale. I don't think this case is in the, the judgment pack unless I'm wrong. But essentially a contracting party is liable for losses arising naturally um, according to the usual course of things or such as may be reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of both parties at the time of the contract as the probable result of the breach of it. So that's interesting, the contemplation of both parties. You can't just say what... Cara thought you have to think what did Vanessa think as well um and we've got an example here I imagine it was made by Hannah um so Anna buys a computer from Haley so she can trade on the stock market online Haley sells a defective computer which malfunctions a day before the stock market crashes therefore Hannah cannot sell her quantities of shares and lost thousands of pounds as a result Anna is bankrupt and is forced to sell her house Anna is then clinically depressed and attempts to commit suicide the remoteness rule would suggest it is unfair to hold Haley responsible for all of the losses that flowed from the malfunctioning computer, thus the damages are limited. So that's quite an extreme example. <laughs> um, but the question kind of to do with this moot problem is we're really looking at loss of profits and the advertising costs that she incurred trying to advertise the beans that never arrived and the fact that there's potentially a damage to reputation and whether she would be awarded monetary compensation for this. Some damages are more remote than others. So it is up to you which ones you argue for the judge. Um, and you'll find hopefully some helpful cases in the judgment pack um, to do with that. Okay, citing legislation. There is one piece of legislation in the judgment pack. It's up to you whether you use it. Um, so yeah, legislation doesn't have citations kind of like cases do in terms of heard in this year, reported in here at this page. Um, so you would just say, you would just kind of say the title of the act that you want to quote from. So here it would be the Human Rights Act 1998. And this little S here means section. So you would read section 11. And then this here is a subsection. So you'd read section 11, subsection A, any other right or freedom conferred on him by or under any law having effect in any part of the United Kingdom. Um, and you don't need to read the orbit. So yeah, and it just kind of says at the bottom what it is. Section A, subsection A. And then if there was another number after that, then it would be paragraph and subparagraph. But I think the moot problem might be all right. I think it's the Sale of Goods Act. Um, 
But if you have any questions about citing legislation, just ask us. It should be fairly easy to Google um, stuff like that, but we'd be more than happy to say. And then, is this my slide? I honestly can't remember. But anyway, we've put together a number of case abbreviations for everyone um, that they can have a look at, which will be helpful when you're having to tell your case citation to the judge. Um, and essentially, all these little abbreviations at the side, you would just read them as the meaning. So give the full meaning. Please don't read WLR, read weekly law reports. Hi everyone again. So what we have here on this slide is a very good visual representation of court hierarchy and it will also help you with um, understanding whether the case is binding or not. So we have criminal and civil cases and there are different courts for those. So especially the lower courts. So we have a civil case so that's like a breach of contract case uh, so that would always start in a county court, then it will go to the height court, and then court of appeal and Supreme Court hears uh, both criminal and civil cases. So I think it's really good to see visually that, for example, we are in the court of appeal. So the only binding courts would be Supreme Court and the court of appeal itself. Um, at the same time, also, you might see uh, the Supreme Court being uh, named as a um, House of Lords. So the basically, Supreme Court was called before House of Lords and it only changed, I think, in 2005. So yeah, if you see the other name, House of Lords, uh, don't be put off with that because it's basically the same court, just with a different name. So yeah, just remember that the cases should be binding. Um, and yeah, it's always better to use the case of like Court of Appeal and Supreme Court as well. So here are some tips for you to tackling the issues of the MOOC problem. So the first one is basically understanding the facts of the case and noting the parties of dispute. So I think it is a good idea for you to read the MOOC problem a couple of times. What helped me is maybe print it out and then highlight the sections that you think are important. And it leads to the creating a timeline, especially with the a uh, moot problem that affects postal rule because here the dates are quite important. So I would say maybe print it out for yourself and just highlight the important points that you think are relevant. So we have lots of dates. I think it started on the 12th of March and then 14th of March, 1st of April. It's just good for you to um, understand those details and kind of, um, yeah, just create the timeline. It's going to be easier for you to understand uh, how you can approach this uh, argument, for example. And the third point is to understand the basic of contract law, postal rule, and exceptions. I know it might seem a little complicated at this point, but also maybe try to create a mind map for you. So basically, we have a main um, rule of contract is that acceptance should be communicated to the offerer. The exception to this rule is postal rule, and then the exceptions to postal rules are the other two exceptions of absurdity and the revocation. So if you just want to kind of create for yourself maybe a visual representation as well so that you understand it better. Um, and then, yeah, revise the grounds of appeal and grounds of response. Uh, read the problem question again to kind of see how it applies to the problem question. Uh, and have a look at the judgment pack, select the cases. I think also worth noting that when you are citing some cases for your argument, don't just kind of say that this is the case and assume the judge will understand that that's why your argument stands. So I think the, the most important part is that you apply the facts of the case that you're citing to the facts of your moot problem and kind of show the judge why it correlates, why it's like in the same kind of way should be decided. So yeah, don't just cite the case, don't just throw it at the judge saying like, well, this is binding, so I am right. So kind of yet yeah, try to connect the facts of the moot uh, to the facts of the case that you are citing. And yeah, brainstorm possible rebuttals. Basically your opposing counsels will be um, arguing the opposite of what you are arguing. So that shouldn't be 
uh, very difficult. They're just going to say the opposite thing and try to prepare for that. Try to prepare rebuttal. Um, be polite when you're rebutting your opposing counsels, just saying, my learned friends across the bar might argue, but, and then you're, for example, citing the case and convincing the judge that you're right. And here is some useful terminology. So the grounds of appeal are the grounds that are uh, used by appellants to allow the appeal. So basically when you are an appellant, you are arguing that the decision in the first instance was wrong. So you're appealing that decision saying that was wrong. We need a new decision that is right. Grounds of response is the opposite. You are showing up to the court saying, no, the previous decision was right and what they are saying is wrong. So that's just uh, a simple way to put it. And you'll always, um, you'll, not always, but sometimes you'll see judge saying that, for example, judge in first instance erred in this decision. That just means that the judge made a mistake in making this decision. So to distinguish a case from binding authority uh, and argue that the facts in the earlier case are not similar to your case is just basically saying that sometimes the binding case or the strongest case will be um, different from what you will try to achieve in the moot problem. And sometimes you might find yourself in maybe like a more wrong side of law. So the way out of this situation, I think, is to yet yeah, distinguish your facts of the case in the moot from the binding case saying, yeah, that, that decision is right and it is binding, it was decided. However, our problem, our case is different. That's why that decision should not apply. And then moving on to the postal rule, as we discussed today, is an exception to the rule that acceptance must be communicated to the offerer. So going back to Hannah's examples, usually um, I would have to kind of see Hannah, for example, make a statement that I accept her offer, or sometimes you can accept the offer by actions, uh, but the postal rule is like an exception. So I don't have to see Hannah in person. I can just post my answer and that would be binding. And then contractual damages are a monetary compensation, an award that is aimed to putting the claimant in the position that she would have been uh, if the other party had performed uh, the contract. And then there is just some basic terms of offer and acceptance. So offer is when you express that you want to enter a contract with a specific terms. And acceptance is just your final uh, expression of consent to terms of the offer. And it's usually made by offeree. So. And yeah, revocation is when you withdraw your offer. So again, going back to the examples, you might make an offer and then you might think, you know what, I actually don't want to do that. So revocation is when you inform the other party that your offer does not stand anymore. Yeah, sorry, Rihanna, we just have a couple questions coming in, so I thought we would deal with them. Uh, one question is, can't Kara inflate the damages she incurred from failure to sell the coffee beans? Furthermore, who determines the damages, the judge or Kara? And so kind of answering the first question, yeah, we have to come back to the remoteness test um, and all that type of stuff. So whether they were so closely connected to the breach, that it would be fair and reasonable to actually compensate her. And the second one, um, usually um, the lawyers for both sides will kind of consult someone who'll estimate the loss um, and kind of consider it that way. But really that's kind of a fact. So we're not going to worry about who's determining the damages. Um, but for things like loss of profits, like they would probably get someone in to come and um, calculate that Some, someone that's not a lawyer hopefully um but yeah please don't worry too much about that uh, we just want to know in terms of type can we recover advertisement costs can we recover loss of profits can we recover damage to reputation those type of things just under the general headings um and then the last question which i'll give to someone else to answer because i feel like i've answered a lot when you refer to the judgment pack what exactly do you mean is that what the facts of the case that we organize are called I'm happy to answer this one. 
Um, so for this competition specifically, instead of having a bundle, which is what you would typically use in a moot, which is a collection of cases and legislation that you would create before a moot and put together all the cases that you're going to use, and you'd add a skeleton argument to the front of it and present that to a judge. Instead of that, for this competition, we're using a judgment pack. So it basically means you don't have to create that bundle in any way. It's just there so that you can go to the judgment pack and refer to cases and quotes that have, we've already kind of put into a collection for you. And then all you'd have to do is just direct the judge to the judgment pack. So you'd say, if I could direct your lordship to page five of the judgment pack where this case is and this quote is. Um, so it's almost, it's like a bundle that's there for you to use as legal authority. We have another question. <laughs> uh, I, Hannah will take this one. Oh, it's gone. Um, I didn't have time to read it. No, I, 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 it, it was quite a specific question. And I, I, I know that the, the school have workshops and I think that these kind of more detailed questions about constructing arguments and the arguments themselves are probably best kept to the workshop yeah just to say the the question kind of did seem like that's essentially what the respondent's first ground is we've just put it very generally in terms of the postal rule doesn't apply but essentially it is the offer has been revoked blah 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 so you're on the right track we'll let Rihanna finish her slides yeah I was just quickly going to add on about why they cannot inflate their um, expenses. So as it was said in the previous slide, you should, have be, you should be put in a position as if the contract was performed. So you're not supposed to kind of earn money on this. I think that's something that's called unjust enrichment if you want to Google about that. So yeah, you don't have to worry about it, but basically there is usually someone who would assess uh, your losses and yeah, inflating the losses is just illegal, basically. And the, on to the next slide, there is some recommended reading. I'm not quite sure if um, students have access to those books, uh, but if they do, um, I'll definitely go on to read a little bit about um, communication of acceptance. That would be really helpful for your general understanding of these issues in a contract law. And yeah, if you guys have any, any questions, ask them. We'll be happy to answer. It's just been question after question. Um, we actually had a question for Libby earlier in a workshop that we went to ask. It's hopefully not that complicated. It was in terms of like how do how are the students picked for the international competition or how many there were? I knew that there was four students in the international competition. Um so actually you can have um so Basically, the, the internal competition is a way for schools with multiple students who are really, really interested and keen to get involved. We would really encourage them to take part in the internal competition. And that's a way for uh, us to feed back to schools and schools for them to see for themselves which students are the, the, the strongest mooters to put forward for the competition in March. Um, teams can vary. So sometimes we have schools who um, put forward just two students and those two students argue as both counsel for the appellant and counsel for the respondent. But some other schools have loads and loads of students who are really keen to get involved. And so they might have four students, uh, two who are acting as counsel for the appellant and two as counsel for the respondent, but they might also have additional students involved as assistants. And you can really put those assistants to work in helping construct the argument. So it's a question of, you know, you know, dividing the work out uh, evenly so that no no one person is taking on huge responsibility for everything um, and giving everybody a fair chance to take part, I think. Does that answer that question? I hope. Sorry, someone had a question about... So, well, I was going to say, actually, uh, there's been a couple of questions about slides. So just to let you know that we will be passing on this presentation alongside the recording. So you will be able to go through the recording in your own time and work through the slides at your own pace. Um, so we will be passing on that recording as well. The, I put the pages in the chat as well for anyone that wants them. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we have had a record a record number of questions today. So you can tell I no one likes the post. <laughs> for the final for the final lecture, we <laughs> our student tutors have had a grilling, which is very good. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. There's so much interest, but but as Lydia said. Uh, we've got these workshops, so do take advantage of the workshops to ask all these very, very specific questions uh, and to get the best preparation you possibly can for the internal competition. Any other issues? I can't see any further questions. Oh, one more has come in. Is there a precise definition? Of, I think what they mean the postal rule, not the postal code, but a postal code is something different in the UK, but I think they mean the postal rule. Uh, it's not set out in legislation, but there definitely is um, in the judgment pack that will be the leading authority for it. Um, but it has been modified slightly and it applies to some forms of communication and not to others. So it's more like there's a general acceptance that something sent at the time of except when it was sent it's binding like a letter or i think a telegram um but things wouldn't be binding if they were like i think a telex was an option and i'm not entirely sure what yes that is. yeah i'd probably say like it's more of a principle that that as long as you get the general understanding of the principle then the way that you word it should should be like according to the leading authority should be fine yeah so we don't need to kind of set out in your what's it called um, speech a precise definition but if a judge might ask you could you give me a definition of the postal rule um, and you might have to kind of summarize what it is so that they're happy with that you understand what it is uh, that might be a question to to prepare an answer for you might get that one in the competition and can you would you approach that by just saying in summary or to paraphrase yeah um I mean, it's it's widely accepted that it's a rule. Do you know, what I mean, it's not hugely in debate. So what we said on the slides is fine. It's basically an exception to the rule that an acceptance must be communicated. Um, but if you want to go one step further, you can name the case where it was made. Um, if you can find on the slides where that was, we have said it. So. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't think we have any further questions coming in. Well, well, that's great. Well, thanks very much for your participation today. It's great. And for those of you watching the uh, the online version, uh, you can see a really high standard, lots and lots of interest. And it's really fantastic for us as a team to see. So for those of you who've not had your booked your, your um, workshops yet, please, as Libby said, please do so. They're enormously valuable. You get sort of individual attention from the great team. Um, so I think that's us. So say goodbye from Dundee and look forward to seeing you all very, very soon.